Hello everyone, welcome back to my uh, YouTube channel. My name is Simone Berliat and I'm a professional in hospitality. I've been working in the industry for 24 years. I've been working in Italy, I've been working in Bulgaria, I've been working in Australia, New Zealand, UK. And uh, during this time, I've been uh, learning and experiencing different markets in terms of customers' habits, in terms of products available, in, term of, in terms of kind of services available that you receive as a professional and uh, service required from your customers and from uh, your um, employers. So today I would like to speak about an interesting topic that I've, been, I've seen changing quite a while in the last eight years, which is uh, coffee. Coffee as Italian, it's something quite uh, common. And as Italian, I always consider myself a professional in uh, coffee making. I've been starting making coffee since I was 14 in the professional school of hospitality in Italy. And uh, I have been making it mildly in the espresso style, which means everything correlated to the espresso machine, espresso, cappuccino, latte macchiato. So in Italy, what we have as coffee style is a series and variation of espresso. So you have a short espresso, you have the regular, which is called caffè, and then the long espresso, long macchiato, short macchiato, and uh, with a lot of froth on it, that everything is connected with espresso, so the small amount of coffee. However, coffee for me was uh, really unknown till I left Italy in 2009. What I mean as unknown, I mean that for me coffee was a pretty common and uh, in the cappuccino, in the latte macchiato, in an espresso style. And uh, I never have uh, had to consider different other styles of coffee unless the mocha coffee or mocha machine, which is commonly used in Italy uh, during family uh, lunch and dinners, but not often used during um, everyday coffee consumption. So for us in Italy, you go to the cafe as a form of meeting point, as for as form of break point. You have a short an espresso, you go there, you order it, you receive it, you drink it, you go. That is what is the coffee system, coffee style of consumption in Italy. While cappuccino is commonly consumed during morning time or e afternoon time. So in the morning time, we have a cappuccino with a croissant. Croissant can be filled up with some custard cream, with some custard chocolate custard cream, or even plain. And um, in the afternoon, you can have the same thing. That was, it is kind of common because many Italians, they do not have a proper breakfast in the morning. They wake up early, they go to work, on the way to work, they stop to a cafe, they get a cappuccino and a croissant, and then they go on to work. Then obviously this is my habit, it's coming from the north of Italy, center and south of Italy, they probably have a different habits. However, that is what I can say about a professional um, environment. So living in Italy in 2009, it was a little bit more a shock, a little bit more an experience, and that, and I will explain you why um, soon. Because uh, first of all, I came over here in Australia where I am the first time, and I came as a professional interested to learn about Australian habits, Australian food, and Australian hospitality in an overall point of view. When I came over here, I had the chance to propose myself as professional and saying, look, I've been working in Italy in hospitality industry for 15 years. I can provide you this service. So it was for me a little bit of shock what I said to you before when I realized that the coffee that I was making in Italy as coffee style was not the coffee that was appreciated over here in Australia. 
And uh, that was a really good opportunity for me because I had to question my understanding about coffee as a product and also opened a lot of uh, uh, understanding of products, how a product can be appreciated in one country, changes completely in another country. And that depends from many factors. It depends uh, about the history of the place, the, the, it depends how the product had been introduced, for instance, on the market. And uh, when I came over here, I found products, coffees, that I never had the chance to experience before when I was in Italy. For instance, the flat white, it was something that I never knew it was existing. And uh, the uh, mocha, which was another thing I never knew about it. And even the latte uh, as form of latte, uh, cafe latte or the big cup with milk and coffee for us is not a common uh, drink that you have in a cafe. You maybe have it uh, as form of breakfast at home, but when you are at home, you do not have it made with an espresso. You have a big bowl of milk and you add a little bit of coffee coming from the mocha machine and that you, that is what you have as breakfast. So coming over here, I found myself out my water because I was making coffee in a style that their local customer was not enjoying. So I had to open myself up to changes. I had to understand that coffee maybe it's just a product but can be used and consumed in different ways. So the first thing that I started with it was learning about milk why milk was made in one way or another, what was the better option in terms of quality, in terms of um, flavors, in terms of overall quality. So uh, when I had the chance to learn about coffee, obviously uh, about milk, obviously I learned about how you create this cream, uh, what are the temperatures involved, what the reaction, the chemical reactions inside in the milk, so the, cas the casein, the reacts coagulate with the, the increase of heat and then creates this sort of creamy, dense part of milk which is made mainly by the protein and the fat that is included in the milk. And um, that was the first step. For us in Italy, or at least where I was working, cappuccino was not a frothy top, it was sort of flat and then did not have any chocolate powder on the top of it or even any cocoa powder on the top of it. So when I came over here, I found this frothy cappuccino with chocolate powder on the top. I was wondering why. And then I realized that the flat white, it was actually a cappuccino for me. That's why, unfortunately, when I am overseas or, or I'm traveling, I ask for flat white because to me a flat white is correct, while a cappuccino is not. That's obviously depending your uh, palate and the way how uh, you're used to have coffee. Then moving on, I've been moving in New Zealand and in New Zealand I had the chance to experience flat white made differently than in Australia. So was to me curious to see that the flat white made in Australia was a different product to the flat white that was made in New Zealand. For instance, in New Zealand, the flat white is made with a double shot espresso in the same amount of extraction, which means that you have still 25 to 30 milliliters of coffee extracted, but you would use a double amount of powder, which it was changing completely the complexity and the aroma of the coffee into the drink. And it was again curiosity because how is possible that the product that was used to make in Italy, it was called cappuccino, it was flat and shiny, did not have any bubbles on it, did not have any chocolate on it, became a flat white in Australia and it became a flat white double shot in New Zealand. That was really curious, still not knowing why and maybe someone that is looking, is watching this video is able to tell me why. Anyway, then I, um, I've been traveling again, obviously I've been, uh, or oh, the first thing when I was in New Zealand, the first time I had finally the chance to see the automatic grinder, which was something that I was not used to work with in Italy, 
when I left Italy in 2009, automatic grinders, they probably were already available, but they were not so common. When I came here in Australia, I found this crazy habit that was developed as a normal routine in the coffee making that I could not understand because it was going out, it was going on the technique of grinding coffee, which was um, so mainly when I came over here, they were again the coffee grinder, they were the volumetric grinders, which means that there were not there was not any time counting during the process of grinding but the way was that you had a container when you were grinding the container they were grinding the coffee the coffee would be grinded and left inside in this container and then you were flicking out the coffee using some um what do you say levers you had you have a lever and you had some uh, what you can call flaps inside in the container they when they are fill up properly they provide to you the right amount of coffee you were having to use for one portion. However, in Italy, it, was, it is probably still common to fill up the container or grinded coffee, at least half of the container. So doing so, the amount of powder, coffee powder inside in these specific slots into the grinder, it was always full. And I was providing that average six slash seven grams of coffee powder per portion that's used in Italy to make an espresso. So that was my technique, my base on technique. That was where I was basing after the pricing of the coffee and all these kind of things included the flavors you can find in the coffee because up to a sort amount of powder you have sort of uh, flavors coming you increase powder maybe we increase some of flavors but at one point you just start to waste the product then i come here in australia and i found that there was this habit that it was actually taught from professionals to do not fill up at least half the, co the grind the, the coffee grind the container but it was to start to grind the coffee at the moment of the, uh, the, the, the service, so extraction of the coffee, and then keeping flipping this flap aside the coffee grinder in order to fill up the, um, the handle group. But at that point, the handle group, it was an unknown measurement for me because there was no use to use the handle group as measurement. I was used to use the flaps inside into the coffee grinder as measurement and it was obviously changing completely how the coffee was extracted over here then probably someone has realized it was a technical mistake because you were not able to provide a standard measurement of coffee powder into the handler so what they come out they come out with other crazy in my opinion again technique which I've seen used to start with in New Zealand, while in Australia was still not common. But now coming back in Australia after eight years, I found that now some people using over here too, which is to fill up the handle group with the coffee powder to the limit, and then take the cup of the, 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 the container and scoop out the coffee powder from the handler to the container so back into the coffee grind container again to me there was completely no sense because you couldn't measure the amount of coffee in the hand group you were wasting time on this process of grinding and flapping flipping and then the scooping out the coffee on the top which actually caused to me a little bit of problems in New Zealand because as professional I've been saying this is unprofessional and then that this not providing a proper measurement a measurement uh, service to the final customer and because we have a standardized coffee machine that is designed to provide some specific temperature some specific pressure in the service changing the amount of coffee powder used to produce this espresso, this coffee drink, it was completely changing the final product to the customer every time that you were making a coffee. Included the fact of natural changes of humidity and temperature, which is are, were making much more difficult to maintain standard quality in the coffee service. However, 
when I've seen the first time the coffee grinder, automatic coffee grinder, I was happy. It was in a roastery in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. And when I saw it, I thought immediately that is correct. Because I remember the one of the topics that I had with other my colleagues here in Australia, it was that the coffee powder, the coffee beans, they should be grinded at the moment to do not lose the quality that they have inside in terms of flavor. So one of the technical mistakes that was done in Italy, it was to grind the coffee powder earlier in the day, sometimes keeping the coffee powder grinded for the day after, from the day before. So grinding the coffee at coffee beans at the moment, it was a higher standard in terms of grinding. Well, having an automatic grinder was solving a big issue in terms of standard um, standard service, standardized service, including them in the procedures, which was which made me quite happy. Then I moved, I, I passed through China for a little bit and uh, I went in UK and over there in UK, I've seen something coming through that I did not know at all. Again, I had the chance to taste myself on a new market as a um, a restaurant uh, manager and a business developer and I had the chance to face other professionals which they simply created extra spaces in my brain still connected with coffee. For me coffee was a drink made from an espresso machine. It was starting to move into be a drink made from a different kind of machines that they are provided different brewing styles. For instance when I went over there, I've learned about more the French press and I came in contact with some new um, st styles which were not new at all. Some of them, they were really old, but they were not common of the market where I was coming from. They were when I learned about the Sky, which was the S-C-A-E. Uh, it was the, uh, the, the quality Speciality Coffee Association Europe and uh, there was the moment in which I began changing my way to approach the coffee as a drink. Then I spent one year in Bulgaria dedicating myself on agriculture, developing an agricultural business over there and over there the mine common coffee known is the coffee the coffee coming from the automatic vending machines that they are providing this coffee powder blended with water and probably some milk powder too that is um, unpleasant to say but I can't say that is bad or not simply because the matter of where you come from what's the market that you use to live in and what the products that you used to have they are making your standard so to me they are not no coffees but for people that was living over there, they were normal, especially when there was coming out the concept of coffee aromatized with different powders that were changing the flavor of the coffee. To me, it was killing me, but it was not possible. Now, I believe so that I just hit the microphone with a good punch, so I hope that I didn't scare anyone in the room. Well, next, I moved back in Italy and over there, I was curious about this association and I had the chance to spend a little bit of time uh, working with professionals. They were looking to improve their knowledge in terms of coffee, coffee quality. And there were also, I've been doing a course, this first and the second level of barista course in a Sky Association which was the European Association, where I learned about the coffee history, where I learned about the different process of uh, coffee making and production that is applied to the product. In the meantime, coming back over here in Australia, the association has uh, blended with the, Sky, uh, the, 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 the Speciality Coffee Association America, so it was a SCA, I pronounced it in Italian and then became the SCA, SCA, Speciality Coffee Association, that's it. And it was really a nice moment, I believe so, because since that I've seen quite a lot of changing in the industry of uh, coffee service. 
Now, for who doesn't know, and then we're going to introduce a little bit of how history of the coffee, coffee being discovered in Ethiopia. And it being discovered quite long, long time ago, probably around the 1500, sorry, 1400. It was discovered, the legend says, that was discovered from uh, um, a shepherd that was taking their ships, oh my god, their ship uh, in uh, um, roaming around, the ship they were eating uh, these sort of berries and they were super energetic and uh, the shepherd was curious about, he collected his seeds and made his drink and he realized it was energetic. Then over there it became a wild drink, common drink, and then someone from the Yemen, or Yemen, that is on the other side of the Red Sea, they found this coffee, this product, and they, because they were uh, merchants, they were traders, they considered that to export in Yemen. In Yemen, it became a common drink, it actually uh, became a a common drink used in the Sufi, I believe it's pronounced like that. If it's not, please let me know in the comments below, which are, uh, it's a sort of religion. Again, apologize, I don't know much about that. Maybe it's a full religion. Just please let me know it is. And they was used uh, a sort of religious drink. Then the coffee bean, the coffee as drink be moving all over the uh, Arabic Peninsula. And then it moves again back in, in, in Africa, but also in Europe. So it came up in Europe and from there moves in China. And then from China, I've been passing through the Barbon Island. The Barbon Island, it, is, um, uh, it was known as Barbon Island and now is known as uh, Reunion, which is an island close by Madagascar, right? Where over there, I think, where French traders, they move. The, the coffee plant and is from where the Barbon uh, Arabica um, variety is coming from. So the coffee plant, which it was the Arabica typica, has changed because the change of climate, because the change of soil, and then mutate a little bit in a different style of coffee. That's why many of these uh, plants, coffee Arabica, they have different under, other varieties. Okay, then moving from passing through China, went in America and then settled down in South America where it was the best spot, the best place. So that's when people think that coffee is a product coming from Brazil, created or invented in Brazil, not at all. Brazil is probably the biggest producer of coffee on the planet but it's not where the coffee plant is coming from. It's actually for many places they are serving uh, quality coffee, speciality coffee, uh, speciality coffee to their own customers. You may have a chance to see coffee, co coffee beans coming from different countries. Sometimes you have a chance even to see and choose where the, uh, the, the specific plantation the coffee is coming from, which is like speaking about a cruise uh, for French wine or DOC or DO for Italian and Spanish wines, which means that we got to the point now that we are able to track where the coffee beans are coming from and that this is uh, providing a quite high impact. Sorry, just double checking because I was I'm getting blinded from the light, apologize. So, uh, the, uh, we can understand the quality of the coffee beans from many characteristics that they are applied to the producers, where it's from, what's the altitude, what's the level of humidity, because they are impacting the production. So, uh, some curiosity about the coffee plant. So what we know as uh, coffee, uh, as um, Arabica, this is Arabica typica, which is one plant. And then the, the other one that is called um, Robusta, it is in this case, I don't remember the name, so I'm gonna fix it if I can read it. If I can't read it, I'm simply blinded from the Okay, perfect. Apologize again. 
So the Kofia Canephora, Kofia Canephora, which is a sister of the Kofia um, Arabica, and the Canephora is mildly known for the Robusta variety. And then if it's called Robusta in Italian, I don't know if any other languages, strong. And the strong, why? What it means? It means simply that it grows lower altitudes than the Arabica, and then it's stronger in taste, it is stronger in uh, against parasites. So it's easy to produce uh, Robusta than Arabica. Therefore, it's probably one of, and that it was a flicking point when I understood and I had a little uh, idea bulb coming out, which was, oh my God, now I understand why in Italy there are so many coffee that they are blended between Arabic and Robusta. And why so many coffees, they have this kind of chocolatey flavor that is going to come a little bit after in this, this description. However, so passing down uh, through the Arabica, you have the Arabica Typica, you have the Arabica um, Bourbon, you have many other, and other varieties that they've been uh, croxed to create a better product. There is the Blue Mountain, for instance, is now is famous to be a, a high quality coffee beans coming from Jamaica. But also there is another uh, sister variety of the typical, which is the geisha, which is something that's fascinating to me quite a lot, especially because it generally comes from really high altitude places. And we are going to move in what is my favorite part, which is speaking about the plants. So speaking about the, um, the coffee, the coffee, I would like to speak more about the Arabica coffee. So the plant can grow up to, I think, 10 meters. We keep it around three to five because it's easy to work with it. And then it's a, it's a plant that grows in equator area. So around, I don't know specifically what, what is the round of the, the degree. However, generally when this humid is hot, but not too hot, it doesn't freeze down. Okay. The plant grows quite high, goes from 700 to 2000 meters above the sea level and generally is a plant that grows under other trees. So it's not the one that makes the canopy on the top. What's a crazy characteristic about the coffee is that it blossoms, the flowers of the coffee are coming out every time after you have a big rain. So you should immediately flick something in your brain that says, what's the problem over here? The problem is that when you have a plant that a plant every time makes a new flower or new bunch of flowers, every time there is a big rain, it's going to happen that for the same season, maybe in a couple weeks different, you're going to have beans or cherries because the coffee, uh, coffee seeds, coffee cherries are called cherries. That they are ripe, other one they are not ripe, and others one that they are still in a flower shape. So that is when it comes the understanding of the speciality coffee, why it was created. Because obviously for big producers, they look for the quantity, produce high altitude, it was too expensive. So they were moving down, down the hills, trying to produce with mechanization, with water irrigation, direct light sun in order to have a bigger production, production production, sorry, and having a process of collecting that was allowing to produce almost at the same time, collecting all the products in a plant and move somewhere else without caring about the next stage of the, of the cherries. So you were collecting plant, you were collecting cherries, they were ripe, unripe, overripe, sometimes they were just flowers. And then the speciality coffee instead is focused on collecting the product, the best quality, the best level at the right time. So that was changing, completing the, 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 the process of collecting this seed, this, sorry, these cherries, because at that point you were having to have local label, label force. You could not work with a machine, you were having to work with people, and then they were having to live and work at high altitude, which means they were also redirecting the resources to the rural communities. Because obviously people living in the cities, they were not picking up cherries 
uh, coffee cherries from 2000 meters above the sea level plants. They were looking to have people working and living over there, specialized. They were not stripping the cherries, that is called like that technique stripping, but they are picking the cherries, which means they were collecting cherries at the right stage of uh, ripeness in order to have a better quality product at the end. Then, well, the, the making process, how to start from a, coffee, a cherry to a coffee bean, almost ready to be toasted and grinded for all coffee. Well, at that point, in that case, there are two mine techniques. One is called natural and the other one is called wet. Okay, washed more than wet. Okay, so the natural process is quite simple. If you want to call it simple, cherries are collected. They are left to dry out on beds, concrete beds, even floors, sometimes depending what's the quality that you want to achieve, and what the situation where the product is created. And uh, when the cherries, they were drying out enough, you could remove the cherries from the seeds. And at the point you were having the seeds with the pergamino on the top, which is a small uh, silky, um, skin that because it was drying out they were easy to remove and they were ready to ship while they washed instead it was a, a process created for um, I really don't know actually it was created again if you know why it was created the wash system the wash technique please leave the comments below I'm really interested to learn more about these things anyway wash was squeezing the cherries in order to semi partially remove these, uh, this pulp but the best thing was left macerating in water for a bit doing so the pulp on the, on the cherries it was simply slowly slowly disassemble itself it was easy to remove from the seeds and at that point they were ready to be dried under the sun for a little bit or under specific machine machineries and then remove the pergamino and ready to be shipped the main difference between the two coffee styles well obviously natural style it provides much more fruity style much more fruity flavors while the uh, the washed style produce a much more uh, citrusy floral flavor. Then, where the coffee is coming from, the altitude it also a really interest um, connection with the amount of caffeine. For who doesn't know it, caffeine is a system of uh, protection. So the coffee use caffeine to protect itself from, from possible predators, in this case, nice and lovely birds, and also use the caffeine as sort of antifreeze. When it gets too cold, the coffee plants uses this caffeine from the beans and protecting itself. I don't know if the plant of the beans, that's again, I'm not so specialized. If you want to leave it easy in the comment, it's good for me too. And uh, the um, birds, if they eat the, 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 the cherries with amount of caffeine inside, they are probably die. If they don't, they're not going to do that again. Because it's like for us, if we're going to drink 65 espresso coffee cups, we're probably going to die for an heart attack or for some other bad things. However, so in, at that point you should flip in your mind that coffee is coming from a high altitude that they can't be uh, worked by a machine that they have to be picked and not stripped that they provide resources to the local environment the local communities and also they have a lower level caffeine because the level of the, the cold um, the cooler weather they're probably the best and that is a standard that is actually some uh, used in the SCA association that they pick the high altitude places where these concepts are took on. Well, I believe we've done a long journey so far. If you've been still watching the video, thank you very much for watching it. Um, if you have comments, again, leave them in the comment section below if you like the video place a like and you can subscribe to the channel even though 
I won't keep posting many videos all the time. I'm just going to do some special videos for you guys if you're interested. So if you want to know more about coffee, if you want to know more about hospitality in South Australia, even in New Zealand a little bit, I can help. Or if you want to know more about other specific topics, you can contact me through the link below. You can contact me through my emails that they are still in my uh, YouTube channel. I hope you enjoyed the vision and we'll see the next time. Bye from Simone to everyone. Ciao.